Well, I, I was watching TV and, and I was watching some Disney stuff. The only reason why I was watching Disney stuff is because my grandson, I got to talk to him about it. And I watched Aladdin, cute movie, cute little cartoon. But throughout the, the, as I'm thinking about the things as I'm watching with the grandson on the other side of the state in Zoom with me, we're watching together TV. Him in Boca Raton and I'm here. So I'm thinking about this stuff since it's not really there. <laughs> and you know what? I realized that the red cord, notice the red cord that connects all of the panels of our art collection, which is basically a summary of our biblical history, it's like the magic red carpet. Yeah, I think of stuff like that. So today I invite you to join in our magic red carpet as we continue in the court of the Holy Spirit throughout the whole church history. It's interesting that, that it's red because we, it's reminded us of the Holy Spirit of the passion of Christ also, as we think today. But some weeks ago, uh, uh, we began this series called This Rock Shall Speak. And this series, for those of you who are not aware, comes about from a research that we did on the meaning, the, the art, and, and the significance of the 19 panels that are here in our worship space and the grand window. We were researching and trying to find out how do we link this great art glass, glass art that is in our worship space with our worship, our spirituality, and our community. With a community, we, we do tours, and we have tours that come, and we, it's an interactive tour. We go back and forth in about 45 minutes, uh, very well attended sometimes. Um, but then there was a worship series. And this whole program, it's a year-long program that we were able to get the grant from the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So this is that legality. This program comes to you by a vital worship, vital preaching grant from the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with funding from the Lilly Foundation, combined with funding from the Tampa Bay Presbytery and St. Andrew Presbyterian Church, period. I do that for the camera because this is going live and I have to do this legality. I wasn't doing it at the beginning. I'm doing it now. So basically, we began some weeks ago with a story of creation, how God shows us in those three panels that creation is created by God. God creates creation. God, you know, we have the issue with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I got to confess, when I'm confronted with that story, man, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble by saying this, but I got to confess, when I'm confronted with the story of, of, of Adam and Eve when they were with a tree and, and they had to choose... Uh, you know, they have the tree of life, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat. I don't think I needed the serpent. I would have eaten it and died. Yeah. Now, what died was our ability to worship, to communicate, to have that intimacy with God that they lost. That's what died. But, you know, the Old Testament has around 968 chapters. Do you know that? 968 chapters. By chapter 6, God is fed up with us and sends a flood. But in God's grace, he brings the rainbow, which is the third panel here. The rainbow, which reminds us of God's grace. The rainbow, which reminds us that we are all together in God's covenant of grace. And from there, we travel across the space and we go to the other panel of the Old Testament where we see the law. In the middle over here, look on this side. This is the law. We have the, the second panel of the Old Testament with the, uh, the, the, by the way, the Ten Commandments are there. Big stuff this lately in the news, ridiculous stuff. But, you know, if you notice, there are four commandments in one side and six in the other. How many of you need to see five and five? Because that's the way it should be. Well, the reason why there's four and five and six is because the first four commandments encourage us and teach us about God and us, of my relationship with God. The other six, guess what? Those are the ones that get us in trouble. Has to do with our relationship with one another. That's why it's divided like that. But then we also see the prophets and the kings and the worship of the tabernacle and the temple of David. The prophets, the kings, everybody who was in those days, they were struggling 
with the law. They were struggling. They, they were having a hard time following it. And we see that some kings followed the Lord and some kings did not. Prophets were, you know, confronting the kings constantly about their, their unfair practices to the poor, to the immigrants, and, 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 and to the widows. That was the prophet's duty to tell the government, you're messing up. And then at the same time, they turned around and told the people, you're also messing up. That was a duty, great position to be in, you know. So they all struggled with trying to follow God. And they found out they were weak and they were incapable. But there were promises between that window and this window here in the middle. There are promises, 300 promises about Jesus Christ. And then Emmanuel comes, Christ with us, that tells us that the Lord the panel of, of, of the rainbow, the, that grace, that grace has become flesh. That grace has, has a name. His name is Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one whom we have been singing and reading that his death was a substitution for ours. That's the summary of this whole. It was a substitutionary day. That price that we were supposed to pay, Jesus paid it all. That's the way the old hymn says. But then we see the three crowns of how the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's grace is not only for the Jews, but it's for everybody, even astrologers from Babylon that we call the Magi's. Then Jesus went in, in, into ministry. He was baptized by John and sent to preach the gospel. He went out to preach the gospel, and he got in trouble. He got in trouble because he was saying things that he wasn't supposed to say, but then we move to the center panel here, and we see the miracles. The, now, those of you who are not aware, uh, Sally, you, you remember this. The central panel is always the main story, right? And then the panels to the left and to the right, they complement that central panel. So in here, we have Jesus is the light of the world. And that central panel refers mainly to the parable, whoever has a light and puts it under a chair or under a basket. No, if you have a light, a lantern, you bring it up so that the more, the higher the lantern is, the less shadows there are. Notice that. That's why the light fixtures are up there. But then we see that that light became flesh, and that light did miracles, and we see it in the miracles of the first miracle of wine turning, of water turning to wine. But not only was he majestic, in deeds and miracles of changing weather and healing people and feeding thousands. But his words, which is that fish thing he said. By the way, that fish thing, what it says is ichthos. Those are Greek letters inside the fish. Ichthos is the word fish in Greek. Fish. However, the word fish in Greek, ichthos, is an acrostic for Jesus Christ, God's Son is He. Jesu Christos, Theos Genoskos Esti, in Greek. That's, why, that's what that means. So not only was He amazing in His deeds, He was also amazing in His words that got Him in trouble. And because He spoke in favor of God's love, and not in favor of the oppressive law and the ruler of those who were in power, he was condemned, and he knew it was going to happen. So now we travel from that panel to the one next door. By the way, I found out that, it, that this panel was supposed to be over here, and that one was supposed to be over there. You know the story. They put one, and they were not going to take it away. So that's why we go this way, that way, that way, this way, this way, that way, and then we jump here. It happens. It even happened in the 90s. So it's amazing that here we are in the story of Jesus who is going to, to, to give us all. And the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was baptized, sent into a mission to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the years of favor of the Lord. Now listen to the scripture as I read out of 2, is it 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 18 and 19. And I'm reading this verse from Paul because Paul, knowing the story of Jesus and actually meeting Jesus himself, he attempts in all of his letters, in one way or another, to tell us the meaning of Christ. 
And in this few couple of verses, I'm going to read actually through 21, from 19 through 18 to 21, Paul tries to summarize why that happened. Why was there a crucifixion? Why was there a substitutionary death? Why that way? Listen to the scripture as I read from 2 Corinthians. And all these wonderful gifts that we have received from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciliation, of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making an appeal through us. We speak of Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The word of the Lord. So this brings us to our present panel, the triptych of the passion. Uh, instead of, a, you know, when I look at it, remember the main panel is the center. But when I look at it, I don't see a cross. I don't see the spears. I don't see the death of Jesus in that middle panel. That's not what I see. What I see is, is a table, right? This column blocks it. What I see is a table. What else is on that table? Grapes and what else? Wheat. Wheat. Well, there's grapes and wheat. Wine is interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sheaves of wheat, grapes, and a cup. Now, I found out the designer, she belonged to the United Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ. That's why that cross is in that cup. <laughs> That's why the, the, the emblem of the, of the disciples of Christ, you should see, is a red cup with a cross in it. She just did it gold. But that's a symbol of what her, where she came from. So we have that table, but that's a table. That reminds us of, of the Eucharist, a table right here with no elements. That reminds us of the table. So if in the passion of Christ, triptych, the table is the middle panel. That's the main story. I think I better go to the other two panels before I try to figure that one out, right? So let's do that. Let, let's go to the, to the left panel, which we find the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the passion of the... We find a, a, a leaf and a cross, two symbols. Now, the leaf has two colors. Notice very well. One color is light green. The other one is dark green. Spring green versus summer green, I wonder. And it's amazing. That what stands, and, and then the cross is right on top. By the way, that is the only cross in the 18 panels down here. But when I look at it, I see it towards the back. The palm tree or the palm leaf is telling me something that is happening down the line. Hmm. The ribbon, if you look at it, is upholding the leaf. Resting it like God is in control. Yes, Jesus came to do amazing miracles. He came to speak very amazing words. But he came also to be the lamb of sacrifice. The sacrificial lamb, the ransom for us. For God made Christ, our scripture said, who never sinned to be the offerings for our sin. But something new is going to happen from there. You see, this substitutionary sacrifice of a death of an innocent man who, who, who carries all of our sins. He carries our weaknesses, as Dottie read. He carries our sickness, our sorrows. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment from his own sin. No, it was because of our own rebellion that he was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be healed and whole. He was whipped so that we could be restored. Hmm. Now, that's fascinating that, it, that, that we have this narrative of a person who was sent by God, who was God, who spoke amazing words and deeds 
of God because in that light was the life and that light, that life was the, that light was the life of people. Now he's dying at a cross. What for? Why did Jesus die? This is a real sermon, so we'll be here for a while. Why did Jesus die? Well, let me summarize it in, in, in just three words for the sake of make it more simple. But this could be a whole, there's books thicker than this Bible that describes that whole thing. Many Britain. But basically, God sent Jesus for redemption. Christ came to make it good with God. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself so that no longer counting people's sin against us. No longer our sins, our, our inability, our weakness, our brokenness, no longer our evil will be an excuse for us not to have a relationship with God because Christ has paid, has forgiven us and assured forgiveness and assured eternal forgiveness for ourselves and for others. And yes, by the way, we get to go to heaven. I mentioned that in passing because I think that's the way Jesus dealt with it, in passing. Redemption is the important thing. Heaven is the consequence. Relationship with God, and then eventually heaven. But not only did Jesus' sacrifice assures our eternal future, not only does he also has the power, it also actually has the power to renew, transform. Redemption is part, but why redemption? If redemption is not going to have the power to change our minds, to change our ways of thinking, to transfer us from the worldly, limited, hateful thinking to a loving, compassionate heart of Jesus. That's the process of that whole triptych there. Notice how we're getting closer to the table. Not only did Jesus die for redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, he also died for the renewal of our souls, for the renewal of our hearts and minds. Um, Paul calls it the renewal, change your ways of thinking from a worldly view to the way Jesus thinks. You see, once we had a heart of rock, the Old Testament says, Jeremiah, and Christ and God is going to change it to a heart of flesh. You know what a heart of flesh means? What do you do with ground beef? You shape it into a, a, a little a patty. I used to do little, uh, little human figures that we would eat. It was difficult to fry that stuff. But a heart of flesh is moldable. That's the idea. That's shapeable according to God's spirit and God's word in us. That is also flexible and allows to be teachable to God's spirit and God's new words of compassion instead of fear hate. Jesus would say something like this, you can't serve two idols. Forgive those who hurt you. Love your enemies. That is weird. But then he would act on it. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You see, Jesus was loving, welcoming. He was very uh, inviting of others and stepping out of the dark side of the world to bring the light of the world. Jesus did that so that your way of thinking could change, hoping that you will follow his way of thinking. Once the Spirit begins to mold us more like Jesus, then we're able to better witness of Jesus. Now, not only did Jesus die for our redemption, not only did Jesus die to, to renew our way of thinking, but Jesus died for our restoration. God's ways amongst us. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is amongst you. So the church is the kingdom of God. That is why we don't worship anybody, anything, any other country than God and God's grace and God's sovereignty. We represent a different citizenship. Yes, well, I am American. That's not a problem. But I'm more than that. I'm a citizen of a kingdom that does not tie it up to the earthly things. Oh, is that a pie in the sky when I die? We'll get No, no. Here and now. That's what Jesus said. Let's build it right here and now. To bring us back to the, uh, to the central panel, that's the central panel. To bring us back to the table. 
to, to bring us back to, to unity, to togetherness. Paul says that he died so, so that both people, he was talking about Jews and Gentiles, they hated each other. And I said, the, I, I think I said a couple of weeks ago what the, what the word Gentile means in, in Greek. Ethnos. So guess what? You're all ethnic. Yeah. To make us from two, make us all one and bring us at the table. You see, the table, Christ died so that we could come to the table. When Jesus rose from the dead, he never met with his disciples at the cross at Calvary. He never told them, hey, meet me at Calvary. That's where it will happen. No. When Jesus rose from the dead and invited his disciples to meet him, he never invited them either to come to the empty tomb. There was an empty tomb. He could have party there with them. He told them, meet me at Galilee. And the two, uh, the several locations we went through that after Easter, of every time he met with them, there was always a meal. <laughs> One time he shows up in, in, in the book of Luke, he shows up after the resurrection. They're all locked in in, in the space, fearing that they're going to be next to be killed by the Roman Empire. And Jesus shows up out of nowhere. And he has to tell them, hey, don't freak out, it's me. Cool, it's me. See? It's me. And then he says, aren't you going to offer me something to eat? The next time he's in, he's in, in Galilee, the Gospel of John tells us that he is in Galilee. He sees the, 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 the people fishing, his disciples fishing. They catch nothing. And then he cooks for them breakfast after the, a second big catch when they could recognize who he was. So he comes and invites us to the table. The table of Christ where Christ invites all that means all around the table. A table of unconditional love. A table of hope for all. A table of peace to fix problems. A table of grace. A table of mercy. A table of compassion. A table of forbearance. A table of big patience. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to himself. That means bringing people to the table. For God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself, no longer counting people's, and he gave us this message. This is my problem. I don't have Jesus saving me. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have, I don't have a problem with, with Jesus, you know, giving me all these gifts, but now I have to deal with other people. He gives us this wonderful message of reconciliation, and then he calls us ambassadors. Actually, my, my sister's and her husband's church in Puerto Rico, in Cabo Rojo, Puerto Rico, is called Ambassadors. And that congregation has that identity, that they represent Jesus, and they make God's appeal through them. Can you believe that every time that we say something good, we're actually saying, come back to God? But when we impose our ways, when we hurt others, when the church harms others. Oh, we do that on a daily basis. And we, I may be dealing with that in August, the harms of the church. We hurt others and scare them away from us. But God is using us to call them, not through hate, not through self-righteousness, not through imposing our ways, but through compassion, through teaching, not through disappear, you know, disparaging one another, through mercy, not through condemnation through radical hospitality to those who don't think like us and we think they don't deserve it, in Christ they do. Dismantling poverty, eradicating the structural racism that our country suffers from, and, re and revitalizing the church in worship and in deeds. Paul reminds us, and all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to God. The word of the Lord.